Greetings and welcome back to our conference titled, A Fed for Next Time, Ideas for a Crisis-Ready Central Bank. In this conference, we are looking at ways to improve the ability of the Fed to better respond to future crises in a way that avoids entanglement with politics. This conference is being hosted by the Mercatus Center and the Cato Institute. George Selgin and I have been the hosts. We've had three great panels so far, ones that have looked at reforming credit policy at the Fed, better defining the boundaries between fiscal and monetary policy, and one on modernizing liquidity facilities. If you haven't already seen them, please go check them out on the Cato website for the conference event. George and I have been taking turns hosting the conference, and it is now my pleasure to host the fourth and final conference that is titled Preserving Monetary Autonomy. This will look at the issues of fiscal dominance and preserving Fed independence. I will now turn our program over to Victoria Guida. Victoria is the Fed reporter for Politico. She also covers bank regulations. Victoria will introduce the panel and the program. Victoria, it's all yours. Thanks everyone for joining us for the final panel of this Cato series. Today, we're going to talk about how the Fed can preserve its monetary autonomy with discussion of the proper role and relationship of the Fed and the Treasury Department. I'm joined by three esteemed panelists with a range of international experience. Peter Stella, who spent 25 years at the International Monetary Fund, including as head of the Central Banking Division, where he was responsible for overseeing quality control of the fund's advice on central bank operations for over 100 member country central banks. He also curates the website Central Bank Archaeology. Uh, we also have Sebastian Edwards, a former World Bank official who teaches international economics at the University of California at Los Angeles, and is the author of American Default, The Untold Story of FDR, the Supreme Court, and the Battle Over Gold, as well as George Selgin, who runs Cato's own Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives, and has authored several books, including the recent and relevant Menace of Fiscal QE. A few logistics on today's panel, you all, attendees can submit questions via the Cato webpage, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at the hashtag CatoEcon. Uh, Peter, we'll start with you if you want to take it away. Um, I'm actually told that we need to move to Sebastian first. So Sebastian, I'm sorry if you want to move. Thank you, uh, Victoria. Um, I was ready to uh, take notes on what Peter was going to say on his archeological uh, analysis um, and, uh, and then uh, take it from there. But uh, I guess uh, it's uh, my, 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 uh, uh, my time now to start. So let me, I, I, I've uh, been fascinated by uh, this series um, of uh, uh, round tables and uh, um, I've watched all three of them. And I have learned a lot. And uh, at times, um, I wanted to jump in um, and talk um, at those other uh, 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 meetings. But so what I'd like to do today is um, stay roughly within the topic of our own uh, discussion here, uh, which is how to avoid the uh, entanglement between the fiscal and the monetary side. I'd like to first start with what are really the questions that we're asking. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about theory. Then I'm going to focus on some uh, debates that we have had. Um, uh, then uh, proposals. Um, and if I have time, um, I'll talk a little bit about history, uh, picking up from what was said in the previous uh, uh, sessions. Uh, so what are the questions? So the question I think is very clear in uh, David's introduction to today's uh, meeting. Um, and in uh, the title of the series, how do we avoid the uh, intermingling uh, in a, uh, a, a not useful or even dangerous way between the Treasury um, and the Fed? And this is something that um, we, um, as undergrad students, uh, when we were in college a long time ago, um, have all looked into. Um, uh, and one of the first questions, if you do macroeconomic theory, is you learn what monetary policy does, you learn what fiscal policy does, and then you ask yourself, why don't we combine them? Uh, and then you have to come up with answers or your instructor comes uh, up uh, with answers. And, and th there are two types of answers. The first one is the difference um, or differential effects um, that um, the two types of policies have on the economy. 
And a second type of answers is the dangers that um, each of those policies carry uh, with them. Um, in the very simple uh, theoretical model of uh, an open economy, and I'm underlying here open economy because I think that much of the discussion that we have uh, on these topics uh, is a little bit restricted to open, uh, to, excuse me, to the closed economy. Uh, did I say open economy? In the uh, simple model of the closed economy, the main difference between the two policies is the impact that they have on interest rates. And the dangers is on the monetary side, if you are not careful, of course, um, uh, and you are too lax, you will generate inflation. And we know that inflation has a number of costs, including that the bond market doesn't like inflation. And on the fiscal side, you may run into a fiscal crisis um, and um, some kind of insolvency, and you may become like Lebanon or like Argentina. And today's the news is Turkey, which is about to be downgraded and then it uh, will uh, have to move into the frontier markets, which is not something that any country is uh, looking for. Now, I said that this happens mostly in the closed economy setting. Once one moves still at the undergraduate level, and this has to do with what I wanted to, to mention uh, regarding theory, I, this is Mickey Mouse theory. Uh, once you open, uh, you move into the um, open economy realm, the main difference between monetary and fiscal policy is the way it affects exchange rates. And uh, in uh, these uh, three um, uh, wonderful um, seminars um, uh, that we have had uh, during the past two weeks, exchange rate has been, uh, uh, has been playing a very, very um, uh, modest uh, role. Um, and I think that we have to bring it back into the discussion. And, and when you, we think of theory, of course, we think of uh, Bob Mandel and about 50 years ago or a very long time ago uh, before uh, Bob went into academia when he was at the IMF and he developed the open economy version of the uh, 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 workhorse uh, macroeconomic uh, theory. Um, and and um, I think that we, we, we need to talk about um, um, one of the issues that we would need to address, as I said, is exchange rates, the effect that um, uh, um, having um, a crisis-based excessive QE has on the value of the currency. Uh, the, uh, Steve Roach has now argued that the dollar has come to an end and that in the next few months, we're gonna see a total collapse in the value of the currency. I happen to disagree quite strongly uh, with that view, but we have to bring it in. And we have to bring in the exchange rate issue on the one hand, and, all, and, and related to that, of, co of course, the pass through question, uh, if the dollar does lose value and depreciates uh, in a significant way in the next um, year or so, what's going to be the pass-through and whether it is still the case that the pass-through is very, very small, almost non-existent in the US. So those are, I think, the questions. Um, uh, and I want now to move to, um, uh, and, 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 and the point that I want to make uh, here is the importance of bringing back the, um, the exchange rate uh, into, and, and the value of the currency into, into the analysis. Um, let me now uh, move to what I think is a key issue, um, and that has to do with anchors. Um, I've uh, spent much of my career looking at uh, cases where um, there is fiscal dominance in monetary policy. Um, and those cases have to do uh, mostly but not exclusively with uh, Latin America. Um, not too long ago, at least for people of my generation, Israel was a Latin American type of country until uh, Michael Bruno and then Jacob Frankel and then uh, and, 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 and Stan Fisher came in and put some order on the inflationary front in Israel. Uh, but when you have fiscal uh, dominance, of course, the anchor in the economy is, uh, is lost. Um, and um, uh, it, 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 the, the question is, how does one bring it back? Even when uh, you have some kind of coordination or when you need because of crisis type of situation, a coordination between the Treasury um, and, uh, and the Fed. And I think that here we are a little bit at a loss. Um, what is the anchor in, from the fiscal point of view? So 
I get asked this question very often by um, investors from around the world. And the question um, in, in, at the current uh, time is, well, the US had 107% of GDP in terms of uh, public sector debt before the coronavirus crisis. It's gonna move to 120, 130, or God knows what. Is that too much? And then the question is, well, what is too much? And if we remember not too long ago, in 1998, we collectively, the policy community, academics, and so on, decided that the number was 60%. Why 60%? Well, the Maastricht treaties. And there were only two countries uh, in the Maastricht treaties that did not comply by the 60% um, anchor or maximum debt to GDP ratio. One was Greece and the other one was Belgium. Belgium fixed the problem, Greece did not, and we know what happened. Now, after the financial crisis, we moved, although with some controversy, the 60% to 90%. And that is the famous rug of Reinhardt uh, number, uh, the controversy between Ken and Carmen on the one hand and Paul Krugman, and then the discovery that there was a mistake in the Excel. Now, we are now going to move to 92. We don't know what number. It's going to be 120, 115. And here comes, of course, the question again of the rating agencies. What are the rating agencies going to do? Are we going to stand in between? What's going to really anchor this uh, uh, the economy uh, uh, going forward? The second point that I want to make within this uh, debate has to do with the role of uh, velocity. Um, I think that much of the discussion uh, tends to uh, underplay the importance of velocity in determining the uh, final outcome uh, in uh, macroeconomy. And uh, um, uh, if one looks at the international evidence on the effects of fiscal dominance, one of the big problems is that once fiscal dominance starts doing harm in the sense that prices start going, start going up very quickly, velocity increases very, very dramatically. Um, and that feeds back into the problem and um, um, we see it in country after country after country. I'm not saying that that's going to necessarily happen in the US, but I think that it is an area that we need to look at with uh, greater, uh, with greater um, uh, care. Um, I'm, uh, let me try to touch on two uh, additional points. Uh, in terms of practical proposals, um, uh, at some point, George mentioned uh, that uh, uh, We've had a great discussions, but in terms of practical uh, um, uh, questions, we're not having a, a lot of uh, uh, options put on the table. I think it's really very, very, very hard. Um, I think that the notion uh, that Elga brought um, up in one of the uh, of the meetings, uh, a paper that she I think she did with uh, Stan Fisher, um, on having a contingency plan um, uh, prepared uh, uh, makes some sense, but. That brings in uh, how do you put it in place, who is going to participate, um, whether um, the possible beneficiaries of such a contingency plan, say banks, do they have to enroll ahead of time? That brings to the fore the stigma issue. Now, the mother of all contingency plans, if I may say so, is the flexible, the flexible credit uh, line uh, of the IMF. Um, which uh, was, uh, I think, the brainchild of Stan Fisher. I've mentioned Stan many times uh, during my talk. Um, uh, and that until the coronavirus crisis, only three countries had signed on to. One was Mexico, and it signed on to because Agustin Carstens was the number two or number three person at the IMF, and he made sure that that happened. The other one was Poland, and the third one was Colombia. So there were no takers, even though it was very generous, it made a lot of sense. It was much better from a cost benefit analysis than holding very large stock of international reserves. Stigma played a very, very important uh, role there. Second point that I want to make in terms of proposals, um, and I'm uh, coming to the end of my 15 minutes, uh, has to do uh, with the, if, if one has contingency plans, I think one has to have a crisis committee that is ready to, come in and start um, planning and, and implementing uh, the emergency uh, plans uh, for the future. Um, and the question of governance there is a very important one. And all I'm going to do is throw in the question of the uh, makeup 
um, of the Board of Governors. And whether, um, as some people have proposed, uh, we should move more into the agency uh, model uh, where we have um, uh, a system uh, where even if a party stays in power, say, for uh, two uh, administrations uh, where the president is re-elected, cannot actually appoint all of the, or, or, or a great majority of the federal, of, of, the, of the Board of Governors, and where, where we, we will have uh, that one political party cannot have more uh, than a slight, a slight uh, majority. Um, uh, the RFC, and now I'm going to move to, the, to, the, to my history uh, final minute or so. Uh, there was a lot of talk in one of the sessions about the Reconstruction Finance uh, Corporation, uh, which of course uh, was one of the first um, uh, institutions that we had to deal with crisis, and it was founded in 1932. Uh, I thought that it was fascinating, the conversation of how difficult it was to unwind it until it took all the way until uh, 1957. Uh, the RFC was run like an agency, and um, it couldn't have more than three uh, members from one political party in the governing uh, governing uh, body, and that was a very, very important. The other point that I want to make in terms of history, the RFC played a key role in the year 1933, um, and uh, it was um, at the core of the beginning of the last wave of banking crisis, when it refused to lend money to Henry Ford's Guardian a Banking Holding Corporation in Detroit. It then, of course, played a key role when it saved all the Class B banks after the banking holiday and the Emergency Banking Act um, of uh, March of uh, 33. And finally, it played a very strange role in the gold buying program that George Warren uh, the economist from Cornell convinced uh, President Roosevelt to put in place um, in October of 1933. Um, and um, I, I think that, that once you have an institution like the RF, um, RFC, uh, there are good things, there are questionable things, and there are some dangerous things, at least that history tells us, that such institutions uh, can go through that can create a lot of, a lot of, a lot of problems. So, um, Victoria, let me stop stop it now and um i'm looking forward and we'll take notes uh, uh to what peter has to say thanks thanks so much sebastian and uh it looks like we have we have peter here so uh peter if you want to to take it away it's all yours now thank thank you victoria and thank you to katos and mercados for inviting me to be on this distinguished panel today i'd like to divide my remarks into three sections one is to talk about what are central bank quasi-fiscal operations and why they're problematic. Then I'm going to talk about how some countries have resolved those problems or avoided those problems. And lastly, what sort of approaches might be relevant for the Fed. Central bank quasi-fiscal activities comprise policy actions executed by the central bank, although they could be replicated by a government expenditure or tax. Quasi-fiscal operations impact the central bank profit and loss account and balance sheet, but they're not incorporated in the government budget. Significant quasi-fiscal expenditures include subsidized lending to particular industries and sectors, such as the domestic automobile industry, or to banks with political influence, including state-owned banks who have political objectives. Significant quasi-fiscal taxes include high unremunerated reserve requirements, imposed on banks, which is effectively a tax on bank intermediation, raising lending rates to borrowers and lowering rates that depositors receive. And of course, most of us have heard of the inflation tax, which is the tax, implicit tax levied by central banks through excess money printing. So what management problems are created by quasi-fiscal operations? Well, if some expenditures are off budget, then the budget cannot reflect national priorities properly. How can we compare the priority of subsidizing school lunches versus subsidizing the automobile industry if we can't compare them side by side? Even if we think subsidies to the auto industry are proper, how can we contemplate the, collect, the correct way to deliver the subsidy if it's not compared with other ways the Treasury might provide subsidies? Is subsidized credit the best way? Or should we have uh, tax uh, preferences for the industry? Should we give them accelerated depreciation allowances? Or should we just give every automobile worker $20 uh, on their way out home every single day? It's not clear unless we can compare them side by side. 
If quasi-fiscal taxes are not in the budget, then how can we determine whether relying on those taxes is superior to any of the thousand ways the Treasury can tax? Taxes on alcohol, tobacco, carbon, personal corporate income taxes. You really can't compare the inflation tax with those taxes unless they're somehow incorporated in the budget. Furthermore, just like Treasury operations, central bank quasi-fiscal operations tend to result in losses or deficits. And if we just look at the conventional treasury outcome, when there's significant quasi-fiscal quasi -fiscal activities going on in the bank with the central bank, we're not getting a good idea of what is actually the national deficit, nor the uh, increase in the national debt or the composition of the national debt, because many central banks issue debt in different, different kinds of maturities. But since central banks tend to be highly profitable and, if, uh, and pay dividends to the government, Small quasi-fiscal losses really just mean a reduction in the dividend to the government. Now, that might be in the following fiscal year, but uh, the pain will be paid, the roosters, uh, or rather the chickens will come home to roost eventually. But when losses from quasi-fiscal operations become very large, central bank equity becomes negative. Well, there's a problem with most central bank laws, and that is they don't require the treasury to compensate the central bank for losses or for negative equity. And even when the law does, treasuries rarely actually do it promptly. So what happens when central bank equity becomes very negative? So the treasury realizes, you know, during our administration, we're probably never gonna see a dime again from that central bank. We're never gonna see any dividends. So they begin to think, well, you know, what other kind of expenditures can we put as a responsibility of the central bank? Because we're not gonna feel the fiscal cost of it. Now, uh, that might seem, you know, politically uh, palatable, but obviously it's no way to run a, run a country, fiscal management. You know, I've been to a country, a central bank, where the legislature uh, attempted to get the central bank to pay the expenses of the country's Olympic team. Sounds like a joke, but that really happened. That central bank governor told me, you know, they had to hire a full-time lobbyist to sit in the Congress 24 seven, just to fend off crazy ideas that were coming from the legislature who had realized, you know, it's free game, it's sort of free money, the central bank can print it up. Now let's look at some country examples of how, how countries have dealt with this in the past. I wanna start off by talking about Peru. Peru 30 years ago was basically undergoing an economic collapse, a hyperinflation, virtually complete dollarization. It was a Maoist insurgency, Sendero Luminoso, at the gates of Lima, massive quasi-fiscal operations. What happened, there was a change in regime there was a new central bank law. They restated the central bank accounts and introduced a recapitalization program for the central bank. But what was more important was that the new law basically identified all the quasi-fiscal operations that the central bank had been doing. Subsidized credit to the government, to sectors, multiple exchange rate practices. And the new law specifically prohibited them. It's, it's quite interesting if you look at the law. It's like they said, you did A, B, C, and D in the past. Now you can't do A, B, C, and D. There was also a significant fiscal adjustment and the development of a domestic debt market. Both of those uh, factors led to a reduced reliance of the, of the, or reduced need by the treasury to rely on monetary finance. And in fact, the treasury built up large balances at the central bank. So the treasury actually wound up lending to the central bank rather than borrowing from the central bank. And this robust system survived many populist uh, presidencies, uh, including the second term, or the second round of Alain Garcia, who had presided over the country during the, during the hyperinflation. Chile, uh, which Sebastian certainly can talk about, is uh, an example where an extraordinarily strong, strong central bank separation from fiscal policy was introduced in the constitution of the country, in a new constitution. So the central bank autonomy is in the, central, in the country's constitution. Prohibition of government financing is in the constitution of the country. Uh, there was also a significant fiscal adjustment, development of a domestic debt market, significant buildup in treasury balances at the central bank because it knew it couldn't rely on borrowing from the central bank. So the treasury effectively, again, was supporting the central bank's financial position rather than weakening it. Now that law is really uh, the strongest law. We've looked at a lot of central bank laws at the IMF, and I'd have to say I'd put that number one in terms of central bank autonomy, even maybe a little bit extreme for my taste. Um, but it, 
but it really has led to or facilitated a lot of significant improvements in Chile, including the development by the government of a sovereign wealth fund, which it can use to intervene in a crisis. Now let's turn to a couple of countries that were able to avoid uh, getting involved in this situation from the beginning. So Canada is a good, good example. During the global financial crisis, Canada engendered a very small increase, a temporary increase in the central bank balance sheet. That was reversed. And all that we could see 10 years later from those interventions during the crisis is an account which has a, a name called the government's prudential liquidity management account. And that was established in the budget to pre-fund the acquisition of cash that could subsequently be used to continue government spending in the face of a potential inability to raise, to raise market funding for a period of at least 30 days. So essentially the only expansion in the central bank balance sheet of the Bank of Canada was an increase in government deposits that essentially pre-funded spending in the event in the next crisis, the government wouldn't be able to issue domestic debt uh, for a period of 30 days. Does that mean Canada didn't support the financial system at all during this crisis, during the crisis? Uh, no, but it was done on the government's balance sheet and this is very important. So assistance was provided through the insured mortgage purchase program, which authorized a government owned housing corporation to provide longer term funding up to five years to Canadian banks by purchasing up to $125 billion in mortgage backed securities. So 69 billion in those securities were purchased through competitive auction process. And they, they were, this program was wound down. Okay, that had to be financed by the issuance of Canadian government debt. And uh, it, it was wound down by March of 2015. So that's no longer on the balance sheet, on the, on the government's balance sheet. Had that been on the central bank balance sheet, the Bank of Canada balance sheet would have more than doubled from the 2008 balance sheet. Now let me move on to transition to talk about um, the United States and the Fed. I want to start with the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008. That was passed in July of that year during the Bush administration. That law gave the Treasury the authority to purchase and sell obligations of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But in order to assume the powers under this law, the Treasury Secretary had to determine an emergency exists and that action is necessary to provide stability to financial markets. And that's a ding to any politician's political capital to admit, okay, there was a crisis on, uh, on my watch. So that's important. Uh, the authority to purchase the assets was extended only through 2019, so it was time limited. Periodic reports to Congress on the program were required. Funding the purchases was subject to U.S. Code, Title 31, Chapter 31, better known as the public debt limit. Uh, in other words, Treasury had to finance the purchases of those assets by selling Treasury debt. So what happened? Well, by end 2009, the Treasury owned $192 billion in GSE debt. But by March 2012, it had all been sold back to the market. Treasury exited. Why? Well, it was the debt limit. The Treasury couldn't raise any more debt. It needed to fund expenditures. So in order to raise cash, it hired uh, firms to help it auction off the securities so that it could get cash and, and continue spending under the debt limit. So it's very important to see the different governance structure of that program and what the Fed did. So at the same time, in November of 2008, the Fed announced a program to buy direct obligations of housing related GSEs and GSE backed uh, mortgage-backed securities. There was no time limit on that program. The Fed could finance it by selling its holdings of treasury securities, but with money creation. Uh, obviously with money creation, there's no uh, debt limit uh, imposed. There's, there's no limit on that. And once we accept that zero interest rates are our policy, then there's really uh, monetary finances unlimited. So there was no time limitation, no quantity limitation and never any real pressure of issuing technology. Did it make sense for the Fed and the Treasury to be running two virtually identical policies under completely different constraints, governance structures, and balance sheets? I don't think so. So what to do? Well, it would be fairly easy to rewrite the Federal Reserve Act to define the Fed's activities to financial market supervision and regulation maintaining a first-class payment system and the conventional monetary policy, including providing lender of last resort facilities to illiquid but solvent banks. It's much less clear on which side of the monetary fiscal line 
you would put what I call market intervention policy. We could simply say, just don't do it. But I think that's unrealistic, particularly given the importance of capital markets in the US and the global economy. So what I propose is a third entity in between pure monetary and pure fiscal policy. Let's call it a financial market intervention authority. It would have its own governance structure, balance sheet, and assigned objectives set out in law. This third governance structure, uh, the board, would have representation from the central bank regulators and the treasury. Whatever the weighting of the power on the board, at least the treasury should be required to register on an on the record vote on policies to ensure democratic voice and accountability. The entity would be owned by the treasury with paid in and callable capital, which Congress would pre-authorize. It would operate within specific risk parameters in a crisis. It would have to call in additional capital to allow the expansion of the balance sheet. The entity should report quarterly according to international financial reporting standards. This is essential. I am very familiar with both central bank and government fiscal accounting methodologies. Neither can adequately cope with the task of providing the information needed to ensure transparent reporting and accountability. And of course, we need independent audit. The first thing this entity would do is take over the Fed's existing holdings of private securities and get the Fed back to a much smaller balance sheet on both the asset and liability side. That concludes my remarks. Uh, back to you, Victoria. Great, thanks so much. And uh, last but not least, we have George. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, I shan't thank the uh, hosts of this event since I'm one of them, uh, but, uh, but I, will, uh, I would like to thank all of the participants, including this panel for uh, a lot of really useful suggestions. Uh, uh, just to mention a few, uh, we have ideas about modifying the Fed's 13-3 authority, the idea of a standing repo facility to serve several purposes, uh, the idea of emergency and emergency fiscal facility, Peter's idea of a financial market uh, intervention authority, and uh, also the suggestion uh, that Sebastian mentioned uh, that we might try uh, another RFC. Uh, I think, though, that the general lesson in, in all of this is that it's it's very difficult to, uh, and perhaps ultimately it's impossible to completely keep the Fed's hands clean, as it were, of uh, fiscal or credit policy during any major crisis, and particularly during a crisis when uh, interest rates uh, hit their effective, uh, if not zero, lower bound. Uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to do in, in my remarks is to address uh, a somewhat less daunting challenge, but still a very important one in my opinion, which is that of uh, keeping the Fed out of fiscal policy in non-crisis times and doing so in a way that does not impair the Fed's ability to uh, combat crises when they happen. And, uh, and I'd like to, by the way, point out that Peter's remarks make for an ideal introduction to some of mine. So perhaps having him come second was ideal uh, uh, after all. Um, now, some of the points I'm going to be making here are ones that I elaborate in my book, which I hope is less fuzzy on your screens than it is on mine. Uh, of course, it's backwards, isn't it? But it's called The Menace of Fiscal QE. Please buy it. <clears throat> um, the basic problem uh, that I'm addressing is, is one that did not exist until 2008. That year marked uh, the occurrence of what David Beckworth has called the great divorce, that is a divorce of the size of the Fed's balance sheet on one hand from the stance of monetary policy on the other. And this divorce has very important repercussions for the possibility of uh, Fed fiscal actions, the extent to which these are possible, the extent to which exploitation of the Fed's balance sheet is possible, even in non-crisis times. Uh, to explain, let me go back to the old days before 2008. In those days, uh, there was no great divorce. So the stance of policy depended on the size of the Fed's balance sheet. To make a long story short, if the Fed bought a lot of assets, if it expanded its balance sheet, 
that would tend to lower interest rates and other things equal uh, raise the inflation rate, which meant there was only so many asset there was only so much asset purchasing the Fed could do be before it would risk failing to meet its inflation target, exceeding its inflation uh, target. And that's why it was relatively easy under those circumstances for the Fed to fend off any attempts to try to get it to buy assets to support this program or that program uh, with, uh, while bypassing the usual appropriations process because it could say, look, uh, we can't control inflation if we do that sort of thing. Uh, what happened in 2008, as I know most of you know, is that uh, quite inadvertently, actually, the Fed switched to a so-called floor operating system based on payment. That involved two things, actually. First, the fact that the Fed did begin paying interest on reserves, which it hadn't, hadn't done before. And second, the fact that the banking system was flooded with excess reserves. And that left the system in a state that it's been in ever since, where uh, the, the way monetary control has been exercised was not by regulating the balance. Marginal changes in the size of the balance sheet don't necessarily have any consequences for inflation by themselves uh, because the reserves don't have an opportunity cost. Banks will hold as many as you can throw their way, and that can be true even uh, when there's no zero lower bound problem. Instead, the way we control the stance of monetary policy, that is the way the Fed does it, is by regulating the interest rate on excess reserves. What this means, basically, is that <clears throat> now it's possible, even in non-crisis times when interest, the policy interest rate has to be above zero, it's possible for the Fed to gobble up assets to engage in quantitative easing and still maintain control of inflation by appropriate adjustments of the interest rate on excess reserves. This invites, of course, a greater temptation than ever for fiscal abuse of the Fed. Uh, for movements, it gives power to movements like people's quantitative easing and that sort of thing, where the Fed is seen as an alternative to the ordinary fiscal appropriations process. The Fed's balance sheet is seen as a device that can fund projects uh, independently of uh, congressional uh, uh, funding through ordinary channels. Now, I think it's especially naive now, in light of all that's happened, to assume that such proposals will remain on the policy fringe, where I think it was is safe to say they were for some time. Indeed, Congress has already shown its willingness to treat the Fed's balance sheet as a source of backdoor funding. It did that when it passed the FAST Act back in, I think it was 2015, pardon me if I'm off by a year or so, that's the uh, act that uh, was designed to fund uh, transportation infrastructure improvement. It was funded by expropriation, well, expropriating what was then the Fed's surplus capital, which is now a minuscule amount. Of course, central banks don't need a lot of capital they can still function without it, uh, though it has some not having much is dangerous. But the point is, we have a precedent for treating the Fed as a piggy bank. But that precedent was very limited. The central bank only has so much capital to, to expropriate. What the new floor system does, what the great divorce does, is to create vast opportunities for use of the Fed's balance sheet, not by appropriating its capital, but by uh, taking advantage of its power to expand its liabilities. So what should we do about this? Um, well, I, I think there's really only one very basic solution. Uh, I've considered a number of other solutions in my book, but the ro most reliable way to deprive the Fed and Congress, I should say, to deprive the Fed power to accommodate Congress's uh, requests for off-balance sheet funding using quantitative easing, even in non-crisis times, uh, while still allowing the Fed to deal with crises, even if that involves some fiscal activity, 
is to go back or, or rather to replace the present the fed's present floor operating system with a proper corridor operating system of the sort used by many central banks including by the way the bank of canada to which uh, peter referred in, in his discussion uh, in in a, in a corridor operating system you can still have interest on reserves so you don't have to abolish that but the crucial difference is that the rate of interest on reserves is set typically below the policy rate, not during crises when you're at the effective lower bound. In that case, they're the same. In that case, you're in a floor system, uh, no matter whether you want to be or not. But at other times when the policy rate is above zero, uh, in a corridor system, the interest rate on reserves is somewhere below that. Therefore, you're back in an arrangement where, although it reserves are an interest, there is an opportunity cost to banks of accumulating reserves. And therefore, you're back to a world where marginal additions to the quantity of reserves, as happened when the bank, if a central bank is buying assets, will lower interest rates, the short-term policy rate, and will lead to more inflation, other things equal. Now, of course, uh, there are several questions that should uh, arise in connection with this proposal. I'd like to just anticipate some of them. Um, uh, uh, first, the, uh, there are some purported advantages to a floor system, and the question is whether sacrificing those would be a problem. Well, two advantages have been uh, ballyhooed most by Fed officials in favor of this system. The first one, which they don't talk about much anymore, is that it would simplify the business of regulating uh, monetary policy, specifically regulating interest rates. You set the IOER rate in a floor system, and in theory, you're done. That'll be the policy rate, and that's the rate you're going to see overnight in overnight markets. Well, <clears throat> For those of you who've been paying any attention at all to what's happened since 2008, you know that it hasn't worked out that way at all. The Fed's had to come up with all kinds of Rube Goldberg contraptions by which to try to make the system work the way it was supposed to in the first place. And the bottom line is, it's not simpler to operate. There have been more interventions. It's easier to have a proper corridor system. So that that advantage is no advantage at all. The other advantage that's claimed for a floor system is that it means banks have more liquidity, which should make them safer. The first thing to be said about that, and I mean they have more liquidity because they're supposedly piling up on, uh, piling up, they have all these extra excess reserves they're willing to hold. Uh, it's, this is really a very doubtful uh, advantage, uh, first of all, because it's redundant. Today, unlike in the past, we have the liquidity coverage ratio. We also, in the United States, have ordinary bank reserve requirements. Well, you don't need a suspender and a belt, let alone a suspender and two belts. So how many provisions for keeping banks liquid do we, do we need? More importantly, there is a compromise solution that can give us the advantages of a floor system for ruling out uh, people's QE and that sort of thing while uh, still maintaining uh, high levels of reserves in the banking system. And this is a so-called tiered reserve system. Several countries have them now. And that's where you have uh, at least two layers of reserves or excess reserves in the system. One layer earns an interest rate that may be above or at the policy rate that's desired, as in a floor system. But then above that amount, a fixed amount, Interest or, uh, uh, the interest earned on reserves can be below the policy rate. It could even be negative. Uh, that is, uh, at a negative rate below the desired policy rate. In this way, you get, uh, you can have as much liquidity in the system as you want by having a set amount of reserves that pay more than the overnight policy objective uh, uh, rate. But then at the margin, additions to reserves, that, that is growth in the balance sheet, has the usual effect of leading to a marginal lowering of overnight rates and to consequent easing of money and higher inflation, which means you're once back again back in a world where a central bank that's 
import tunes to uh, uh, expand its balance sheet for strictly fiscal purposes because people think that's a good way to finance things where you don't have to mess around with pesky appropriations processes and other kinds of uh, uh, obnoxious democratic controls. Uh, the Fed can say, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that because we can't achieve our mandate if we do. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so we have a ton of great questions coming in. So I'm just going to ask one question and then uh, start start turning to audience Q&A. But I, I did have one question following up on what you were just talking about, George. Um, you know, obviously, the, the Fed's balance sheet is ballooning a lot right now. And at some point, we're going to reach a point where people start calling for it to shrink again. So given that the Fed has said that it's going to stick to a floor system, was there any purpose last time in the Fed shrinking its balance sheet to the extent that it did, given that it kind of just ended in repo chaos? Um, is it, did it serve any kind of political signal? Um, or if you're doing a floor system, does it even really serve any purpose to, to shrink it a little bit? I think it does serve a purpose. Of course, uh, a floor system requires more excess reserves than uh, a corridor system does. Uh, but the Fed, what the Fed was trying to do then was to determine just how few excess reserves it could have and still be running a floor system. And it found out the hard way that it needed more than it thought it would. Uh, but why would it even bother trying to get as low as possible? I think, I think the answer is that uh, it's, it, it's desirable for the Fed to have a small credit footprint as small as possible. And this was long a principle that the Federal Reserve operated on, that they should be as uninvolved in credit markets as possible. They should be a lever uh, for other amounts of other types of intermediation. They should control them, but they should not have a huge credit footprint. Uh, whereas, and, and so what they were trying to do was minimize that footprint and uh, keep uh, private markets doing as much of the credit intermediation as possible. So what we've learned is, what the Fed has learned is that uh, if you have to operate a floor system, if you want to operate it, that footprint turns out to have to be very, very large. Now, just how unfortunate you think that is, is a question we can debate. But obviously, one thing uh, can be said that the Fed seems to have decided at some point that no matter how big the footprint is, a floor system is still ideal. In fact, if we've learned anything since 2008, it's that the Fed doesn't seem to think anything will prove that its decision to have a floor system it was a bad one. I, I, I'd love to know what they would consider a reason for going back because every argument they ever gave for having such a system has proven to be false. So I, I can't really answer for them. If I were Jay Powell and I were asked to defend a floor system, I would I would come up dry. I really would, except for being able to argue that getting to a corridor system to a floor system is tricky, which it certainly is. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, so I'm going to turn now to some of the questions that are coming in. Um, here's one for Sebastian. Based on your work, what is the typical journey into fiscal dominance, and are we in danger of it happening here in the United States? Uh, well, that's a great question. I think it's at the very um, core of our discussion today. I don't think that we are in danger um, of, of, of getting into a situation of, uh, of serious fiscal dominance. Um, but um, I, I, I think that we are slowly moving um, in that direction. And one of the things that has surprised me uh, a little bit in the in this series of, of uh, seminars is that we haven't spent a lot of time debunking or talking about modern monetary theory, which is, of course, at the core of fiscal dominance in a advanced countries. Um, and I think that um, uh, that is the danger that we're seeing. The, the progressives, um, of course, love it. Um, and um, there, there is, a, a, in my view, a very important difference between helicopter money, uh, which is the once and for all type of policy that you undertake during a crisis, uh, 
and a modern monetary theory type of approach, which is a recurrent ongoing fiscal dominance, which as I pointed out, once you bring in changes in velocity can really result in a jump in, um, in inflation. So um, no, I don't think that uh, we are in danger right now uh, in the US, uh, but in terms of the the, the thinking among politicians, slowly, 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 uh, people um, or, or the Democratic Party, which at some point was very uh, prudent in terms of monetary policy, is beginning to like MMT. And I think that we have to be very, uh, very clear in pointing out all the dangers involved. Thanks. And I think uh, Peter also has some thoughts on that question. A typical way you follow the fiscal dominance, in my experience, it's basically been when the central bank has intervened in a financial crisis in a massive way. Usually that's at the time of a fiscal crisis. So the fiscal authorities can't, uh, can't afford the bank rescue and the central bank creates a lot of money and takes on a lot of collateral that turns out to be bad and worthless. So I've known central banks that have wound up owning pig farms, uh, hotels, resorts, uh, te even television stations. Uh, and my point on this is what happens is it's a massive in intervention in a big hurry. The central bank acquires a lot of extremely illiquid assets. By definition, you're assets that are uh, uh, basically based on bad loans. So the banks will go bankrupt and you can't liquidate the collateral. So you wind up sitting on this for a long, long time. So that's the excuse, let us say, for not shrinking the balance sheet for those countries in Latin America and in Asia took quite a long time, maybe 20 years to get themselves out of this. Now the Fed doesn't really have that problem because most of the assets the Fed has taken on are, are pretty solid and, and liquid. So I, I really don't think there's a, you know, a very good excuse for the Fed not to have shrunk the balance sheet faster and that it couldn't shrink the balance sheet again. Um, but based on revealed preference, it doesn't seem like they will do it. But I just wanna point out that they, they don't have the excuse that many, many, many other countries had that the assets they had acquired were liquid and it was going to take a really long time to dispose of them. Thanks. Thanks, it's hard to imagine the Fed buying a TV station, but <laughs> maybe we'll get there. Um, so here's one for Peter. Um, can you explain in more detail how to move assets off the Fed's balance sheet onto the treasuries? Um, true. By the way, it didn't buy a television station. It took it as collateral from uh, some large investor and they wound up owning it when the, the investor went bankrupt. So how do you take assets off the Fed balance sheet? Well, you buy them just like anyone else. So basically the treasury or the market intervention authority would issue debt, acquire cash and buy them, buy them from the Fed. So basically that would shrink the Fed's balance sheet uh, by the amount of uh, monetary, uh, uh, the bank reserves and buy the assets that, that you have. So this has been done in different countries in different ways. Uh, it's quite common after one of these financial crises that I've spoken about for the treasury eventually to do a swap, a bond swap with the central bank, uh, sometimes directly issuing a bond to the central bank and taking off the bad assets and then liquidating them. Uh, unfortunately though, uh, many times the Treasury uh, gives the central bank a 100-year bond paying 0.1% interest, uh, which doesn't really help the central bank very much. Um, it was a very big such bond in Indonesia, and it was called state bond number 007, and uh, they called it the James Bond. Thanks. All right. Um, here's another one, which... Uh... It's a question for anyone, but I'll, I'll go ahead and direct, direct it to George. Uh, should Congress give the Fed the authority to purchase any kind of financial asset during a crisis or not? Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, well, uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, it is not wise for Congress to give the Fed power to buy just any old thing. The question is whether there's any, uh, there are going to be occasions when the Fed has to buy certain assets, or rather, uh, 
when Congress thinks certain assets need to be bought to save the economy from a crisis or something like that. And in that case, there are really two questions. One is, should anybody buy those assets? Is that going to help? And the other is whether it should be the Fed's responsibility or Congress's responsibility through some fiscal authority, which, of course, is a question we've been addressing. Uh, the, my own uh, feeling is that if there's going to be, if Congress decides that uh, such assets, un, uh, anything besides treasury securities and agencies, have to be purchased in large amounts for emergency reasons, then uh, I think it should be done uh, on the fiscal policy books. I think uh, if at most the Fed should be involved as part of a committee, uh, part of a special emergency fiscal facility or the sort of facility that Peter Stella described, so that there are very strict limitations both on when the facility can be used, on uh, the decisions regarding how much it, it purchases, on how much the Fed is itself on the hook versus how much is pre-funded by, uh, by the Treasury, and how quickly the facility will be unwound. I think all of this has to be very clearly uh, predetermined so that we don't, so that we both know what to expect in a major crisis uh, and we can avoid a lot of hanky panky in the major crisis and not end up as some of the countries that Sebastian was talking about and that Peter has dealt with so often have ended up in the past. Okay, this next one is for Sebastian. Um, can you elaborate on your suggestion of moving the Fed Board of Governors to an agency type organization? Uh, yes. Um, agency type organizations, of course, um, a particular political party cannot have more than if there are five uh, uh, members in the government, uh, governance uh, body, more than three members from one uh, political party. Um, and um, there is the notion that if we have um, a particular uh, party that uh, has a run at the White House that is uh, uh, 16 years, uh, given that uh, members of, of the board don't stay for their lengthy uh, term, uh, whether uh, we can have a very large majority by, uh, uh, by one political party. So the question of a political equilibrium is something that has come up um, a number of times. And I think that there are countries, uh, some of the ones that uh, Peter mentioned in his presentation, that at least implicitly have taken that view, where members of the board of the central bank um, have to have some kind of equilibrium uh, with respect to the political forces uh, in the country. Um, and I think that it's something to explore. When uh, I looked, uh, I read back again uh, two years, uh, two days ago, uh, the um, uh, um, uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation uh, Act of 1932, one of the things that caught my attention is that it was operating as a an agency. And even during FDR's time, when Jesse Jones was the uh, chair of the RFC, uh, it had two members of the Republican Party on the board and that they made difficult all the quite controversial decisions that uh, and, and, and policies that the RFC uh, 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 put in place, including the fact that it bought gold with uh, debentures of the own RFC that it uh, 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 gave at a discount, at a huge discount to gold producers in order to artificially move the exchange rate uh, um, above the $20.67 price of gold at the time. So I think it's something to explore in terms of governance. Yeah, and then there's also a question on one of uh, one of Peter's ideas. It says, question for Peter, do you think moral hazard is a problem if there's constantly a reserved fund for handling emergencies? So basically, you know, that that's where I came up with the MIA, uh, I shouldn't say MIA, the Financial Market Intervention Authority. So you have the, you know, you can draw a line here, monetary policy, fiscal policy, but what do you, what do, you do with the stuff in the middle? And one can pretend that, well, we could just say we're not going to do it, but I think reveal preference shows that we are we are going to do that. So if there's moral hazard, there is moral hazard. So I'm not I'm not saying that we should do it. I'm just saying if we are going to do it, this is a better way to do it. And in fact, I, I actually believe 
the current seeming obsession with eliminating all volatility in financial markets is, is a big mistake. I would allow more volatility. I wouldn't be intervening all the time. It's a bit like not ever allowing yourself to be exposed to any illness or take a vaccination. You, you need a bit of uh, you know, live vaccine to develop defenses against it. If you take all the volatility out of the system, the market will stop hedging, will stop developing instruments to, uh, to deal with volatility. And then you're just gonna have one really, really big crisis when it happens. So again, I'm not, not saying we should be doing this. I'm just saying, I, I think we're going to be doing it. Uh, this is a better way to do it in my opinion. And I agree with Sebastian about the agency structure for this entity. I think that's a great idea. Um, but uh, I, I really think the fetish fetishness of market volatility has to be has to be addressed and discussed in the legislation for this entity. Like when when do we intervene? As George George was asking. Great. Um, so we're we're almost out of time here. Before we wrap up, I just want to give Sebastian another minute to talk about uh, fiscal rules as anchors. Well, let me, um, thanks, Victoria. Um, so I was not planning to talk much about uh, Latin America, but Peter brought up a number of cases which are very interesting, and I happen to know a little bit about some of them. So let me very briefly tell you what Chile did um, after its uh, uh, very traumatic experience of 1,000% inflation in 1973, 1974. To a, a, a inflation that, as I point out in my uh, article on populism uh, uh, in the Cato Journal, came from fiscal dominance. The um, uh, overall fiscal deficit uh, went up to almost 30, 30, 30 percent of GDP in 1973, and inflation went up to a thousand percent. So Chile forbade the central bank from uh, financing the government. That's sort of standard in many central banks but also forbade the central bank from purchasing government paper, even in the secondary market. And what the central bank did then, it issued its own paper and monetary policy and open market operations were carried on on the basis of central bank paper, which had been issued. Well, what happened during the coronavirus? It ran out of uh, its own paper. And now there is a constitutional amendment being discussed in the Chilean government that will, in the Chilean Congress, that will allow the central bank to purchase domestic uh, treasury paper in only in the secondary market, but with a super majority of the members of the board, four out of five, and there is even talk of five out of five. So it would really make it an emergency uh, situation. In addition to this, and this is the point that I want to make, is that Chile has a fiscal rule. And the, no, the idea, although it's being discussed how to change it, is that over the cycle, the, 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 the primary balance of the treasury has to be such that a stable uh, debt to GDP ratio is maintained over the cycle. It's not extremely rigid, but it has the distinction between structural deficit, the current deficit, and then they have to be corrections. And I think that this is something that needs to be thought if we want to maintain the separation with, with, between the treasury and the Fed going forward. A fi it, it, you need an anchor. And a fiscal rule is a way of providing a, a, an anchor. And that may be uh, um, uh, uh, that, um, uh, George, that we have suspenders and a belt, but maybe that's the way to go if you don't want to be caught with your pants down. Thank you. Sorry, I almost forgot to unmute myself. Um, so that um, that should wrap our event for today. Thanks to everyone for joining. We had a lot of really great questions. Sorry, I couldn't get to all of them. Um, we had a lot of concrete ideas. Certainly, you all have given me plenty to think about. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to David. That was a great panel and a perfect way to round out the conference. Thank you to Victoria for doing a great job moderating this final panel. And thank you to the participants, Peter, Sebastian, and George, for thoughtful discussions and comments. Also a big thank you to all the viewers who took part and participated in the Q&A and who have been with us these past two weeks. This conference would not have been a success without you. So thank you for participating. I also wanna give a big shout out to all the event staff, the organizers, IT people at Cato and at the Mercatus Center who have played a big role in bringing this conference 
to fruition. We really appreciate all the hard work behind the scenes. So thank you everyone who has helped out. Finally, I want to encourage you to continue this conversation we've started at this conference. This is an important conversation. We want the Fed to be ready, robust, but also constrained and prepared for the next crisis. And the conversation we've started here today is an important one that will continue. We're hoping that it leads to great improvements moving forward. Until we meet again, take care.